Well, thank you everybody for being here. Hopefully everybody's having a great time at the Clayton. It's probably the first time you saw a panel with someone smoking a cigar. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not the first time? Well, yeah, probably. <laughs> probably the first time. All right, awesome. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, today, uh, we're not going to be very content heavy. I really wanted to welcome our panelists and you know discuss a very important topic about cybersecurity. It's truly about education and awareness. And uh, let's just get started with uh, introducing the uh, panel. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Fox. I am a cybersecurity analyst here at FS. Yeah. After each one. Yes. Yeah. Right. My name is Sam. Uh, I'm an account executive at CyberQB. Nice to meet you guys. Woo. I'm Josh Rochelle. I'm the national channel manager at Coeo Solutions. Woo. Yeah. Yeah, thank you to everybody. Thank you to our sponsors today. Thank you to the Clayton. Thank you to our amazing marketing team for putting this event together. We really appreciate it. Let's go. 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 let us go let us for one of the panelists, so um, let's get started. So uh, let's just kick it off. Um, you know, in, in today's uh, evolving threat landscape, what are the most pressing cybersecurity uh, concerns that you see in the industry today? Uh, let's just get started with, uh, let's go. Brian. Uh, yeah, so some of the most uh, worrisome threat landscapes for us is definitely uh, ransomware. Ransomware with more of the evolution of like ransomware as a service, as a service uh, things like that, and as well as BEC, business email compromise. Those are some of the things that really are plaguing the industry today. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Ransomware, um, phishing attacks as well, and then cyber QP, we you know, deal with a lot of breaching the help desk, so you're not verifying end users out of the gray area. There comes up a lot. Uh, in addition to what we've uh, kind of already mentioned, with the evolution of the hybrid ecosystem and folks working from home, is how do you make sure that your end users are staying compliant, uh, securely being able to access your data, uh, both from what you're housing in your data centers and on-premise, as well as figuring out a way to communicate with your cloud applications and, and maintain that level of security. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Question, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, you, here. Go ahead. Yeah, could you describe what Grant, you mentioned ransomware as a service? Uh, so the question is, can you describe ransomware as a service? Yes, I can. So uh, ransomware as a service uh, is kind of this movement in the industry, what we're seeing with threat actors, where um, it's becoming more of, instead of these big threat groups that are attacking, it's actually these big threat groups are now using their platform as a service for smaller client for smaller threat, threats and threat actors. So you're actually seeing these big, these big attackers who are actually now being able to spread their ransomware or their, their malware to many different clients because many different people because uh, they now have the reach of many different smaller threat actors, people with less money and less resources. Awesome. Sam, we were talking about that a little bit today. We did a podcast earlier with Sam. Appreciate it. Um, just the ransomware as a service. Um, imagine, imagine a subscription model for being a cyber criminal, paying thirty nine dollars a month, getting a subscription, getting full tech support, knowledge base, everything that's available through a platform, and being able to be a cyber criminal. Um, it's that easy. So, thank you for the question, Andrew. Um, so when, when we talk about some of these threats that we see out there, um, what are some of the trends? Sam, we'll start with you. Just what are some of the trends that you see in cybersecurity today? Something that I've seen coming up more recently is uh, AI and voice masking at the help desk. With a lot of MSPs that we talk with know their clients, they know the numbers and names, and are really familiar with that base. Um, and people like you know record a voicemail, get like five or seven seconds, call somebody back, sounds just like this person. Um, so that popped up a lot more. You know, 
the fall and you get more advanced. Yeah, off of that, uh, we're seeing a pretty large hit spike in spoofing from the voice side of things. So organizations as they're moving to cloud communications and decentralizing their PPX ecosystems, uh, malicious actors are now hacking into those cloud ecosystems. Uh, they're making calls out to uh, toll-free numbers, premium numbers, things like that. And one of the issues is it's almost impossible to catch. So until that client gets their invoice and notices a five or six figure charge on it, uh, you know, those go unnoticed. And, and those charges can occur within 20 or 30 minutes. You can rack up tens of thousands of dollars in fraudulent charges. And it's uh, often an overlooked uh, component to securing the ecosystem. So we saw a, a very recent incident that occurred um, with MGM um, recently, and that had to do with social engineering. Um, you know, social engineering is a big issue. So on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is, uh, social engineering is a big issue for organizations. Um, what are some of the considerations when we talk about social engineering, um, and how can organizations protect themselves? Right. Uh, yeah, so organizations can conduct themselves in a way of having uh, strict like policies and procedures for different things like uh, different authentication requests or certain high uh, high availability and high different things like that. So if the yeah, yeah. Uh, Josh. Yeah, so one of the uh, areas that we're seeing in assisting clients uh, with this is building out zero trust networking, right? So as you know, malicious actors are essentially trying to impersonate uh, employees and build these profiles to gain access, uh, assuming that nothing is trustworthy is almost necessary, right? So instead of building trusted networks or trusted IP schemes, things like that, which used to be the gold standard when building out the network, that you can't rely on it anymore, right? So you deny everything, you build policy stances to confirm a, a number of different factors when someone's trying to access the network or data. Um, and then we've seen kind of that uh, scalable approach. So for applications with very low risk, you may allow you know, somebody be slightly out of date on an update or something like that to access it. But as you get further up into your stack of uh, sensitive data, you really make sure that you're, you're checking that endpoint, you're authenticating multiple different uh, areas in addition to your two factor and things of that nature as well. Yeah, this is just like what organizations can do to help prevent those. Like on top of getting tools that are gonna assist with security, that's not gonna be a silver bullet, I think. Like there still needs to be an emphasis on employee training regularly. Someone know how to spot a phishing email, not click on certain things. Um, as security tools get more advanced, but also like human emphasis on making sure people know how to spot, you know, threats that can come up. Are you just thinking about getting an IR group? Do you have an IR offering? Yeah, so the response? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. That's an important piece of it. So when we look at when we look at um, incident response, there's four phases of it. There's preparedness, so you want to be prepared for that. There's if that incident does occur, is identification, quick identification. Um, it's recovery and eradication, and then the most important piece that's often overlooked is the post incident analysis. Post incident analysis and preparedness are the most important pieces because nobody wants to see themselves in a um, through um, an incident. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for the questions. If there are any other questions, please let us know. Um, I have a so, my, my cyber insurance carrier, I think, based on their requirements, would prefer I don't do business at all. We've <laughs> <laughs> all well, been there, right? Uh, yeah. and, and so, I guess my question is: Is how do I? What's my strategy for allowing our business to operate, people to get what they need to get done, as well as not having constant threats from? my cyber insurance carrier, which is kind of looking at my network all the time. So how do I do business without upsetting them and still be, coming, still be secure? Yeah, so I kind of touched on the zero trust networking. Um, right now, you know, that, that it's going to be your kind of best premise for keeping everybody happy, right? 
uh, the cybersecurity industry is, is growing rapidly, and as threats are changing, uh, these policies are, are trying to keep up with it, right? Which is why they're more or less saying, just close your business, right? Because oh, we'll insure you, right? Uh, but by building a zero trust network where you have no trusted endpoints, no trusted uh, networking components, and you're verifying everything that comes through, it's building that foundation for your security across the board, right? So uh, no malicious actors, your social engineering is not hitting you, right? You're, you're eliminating a threat kind of at the, the initial point in where your weakness exists, which is at your end user level, right? Uh, not that it's perfect, and uh, there's no such thing as perfect security, regardless of what anyone all will say or, or try to sell you. It's uh, it's best effort at the end of the day, but uh, I really do think that really building that foundation is, is the key to, to really you know, protecting you as well as dealing with your cyber security companies and uh, management leadership executives who might be looking at you as well. Awesome. Thank you for the question. So just to put it in perspective, the cybersecurity industry today, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about insurance as well, but uh, ransomware and criminal activity is an $8 trillion a year business. $8 trillion a year business. So, so to put it in perspective, that's $250,000 a second, maybe a minute. $250,000 a minute. Someone do the math. Ken, I'm looking at you. I know. <laughs> I know. What's the number? $8 trillion. $8 trillion. Okay, give me a minute. <laughs> CFO, CFO, do the math. Okay, he's doing it. Uh, but that's a lot of money. It's eight trillion dollars a year. So when we look at it, this is it's not going to stop. And we look at cyber liability. So cyber liability insurance is something that we we recommend for everybody. Uh, just from a show of hands, businesses. I mean, do you have cyber liability? Who, who in the room has cyber liability insurance? Okay, great. It's extremely important. So when we look at cyber liability for the panel. You know, what factors should an organization consider uh, when deciding the right cyber insurance coverage for their business? Sam, you know your risk level. Every business is different, so I think that doing risk assessments prior to and then being very picky on like the details of your policy, like what is, is there, uh, I don't know, the term like response, coverage associated with that, but I think one of the big ones is like doing a risk assessment, you know, because that's going to vary business goals. Yeah, and, and with that, I think most organizations really under-assume what they need from a, a liability standpoint, right? Um, you know, we've, we've had a number of customers kind of touched on it from the voice component where, you know, everyone makes calls and assume that's safe something flags you go to use your policy and you way undersized it and then you're stuck with a five six figure bill uh, because you didn't account for something along those lines so I think you really to the point is assess where all of your risks are uh, there's going to be risk no matter what you do what you put in place and uh, really take into account right uh, what what a, a true cost is going to be uh, when it comes to that on your policy uh, yeah, just to pick, kind of piggyback from what they said there. Um, I think knowledge overall and understanding of your environment and what you use in your environment is really key too. Because you got to know one how long you can be down or how or the different risk profiles for each of your different assets. Whether it's certain things you can only be down for uh, a very short period of time or some other things maybe you have a little more risk and you can afford it or whatnot. I think knowledge in your environment is really important. Is he kind of you calculating it? Fifteen thousand dollars per minute. Okay. He's got this. I saw him. I saw him. Go on. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, so cyber, cyber insurance last year was the was the only time. So anybody who's in the cyber or in the insurance industry understands it. Cyber liability insurance last year was the only time cyber uh, insurance companies actually lost money on policies. So normally. Uh, insurance companies are going to look at 10 to 12 percent loss ratio, and that's like good, maybe 20 percent. Last year was 75 percent, 75 percent loss ratio. So if anybody has anybody done a gone through underwriting right now on a renewal for their cyber liability, I see a couple of hands. Did that did that application become slightly larger? It's invasive. Exactly. 
So this is going to continue happening. Five five years ago, it was a one pager. Sign off on it, yeah. policy, fax it in, email it in, whatever you got your policy. Now it's becoming a big challenge because it's not if, it's when something occurs. So we expand a little bit on uh, remote work. I'm sure most businesses either have a hybrid schedule, a completely distributed workforce, or a combination of both. Um, but remote work has really created a number of considerations for businesses on how they protect their businesses. So what are some of the things that an organization can do to mitigate their risk and protect their remote workforce? Uh, two of the big things that they can do is, um, one, make sure your accounts are protected via 2FA, or multi-factor authentication. Make sure you're having some type of another factor when users need to log in and kind of do basically anything. Uh, the second thing is to make sure that um, you are using some type of VPN application. Make sure you're protecting uh, your users' uh, internet traffic and their traffic when they're doing their basic activities and basic work. Yeah, I was going to say those two. I think the only other thing to add, which kind of echoing what I said earlier, is like regular employee training on the stuff as well. It's like easier when you're in the office and everyone kind of have this knowledge shared. That's getting lost a lot with remote work. So making sure you have practices to keep people trained up in addition to what he was sharing is going to make a big difference. Yeah, and expand on the VPN side of things. Um, yeah, I've kind of touched on this a few times, right? A VPN is great, right? It's going to give you kind of your base foundation. Somebody who's sitting out there on the web who's trying to hook in, you know, you got encryption, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, but one of the, the issues is, is those endpoints, right? If your end users are uh, updating your firmware, your Microsoft, your, your Dell, et cetera, all of a sudden now there's holes into that network, right? Those things have not been patched. So you have a VPN that's become a trusted network and there's an exposure due to the fact that your end user hasn't patched it, right? They haven't done that update. Now you've just exposed your entire corporate network because of it. So implementing a VPN solution that's going to take those things into account, right? And check those endpoints to make sure that they are up to date, that that endpoint is not exposed prior to giving them authorization to connect is really key when managing those systems. You got some smoke signals here. I don't know what it is. That was, that was a three minute warning, three minute. unless you like more. Three minute warning, okay. Well, we still got, we still got about two hours. Disregard. <laughs> 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 up, everybody. Here we go. Um, all right, so make sure, make sure that uh, everybody. So, cybersecurity oftentimes is just seen as it's an IT issue, like it's the responsibility of IT. But as a matter of fact, it's actually more of a business issue in mitigating risk. So, bridging that gap. What we've seen is that, you know, yes, it's a priority of IT. I was actually speaking with a few people here tonight that, yes, our IT guys are really passionate about it. They love the cybersecurity. They love getting into it. But as a matter of fact, it's more of a, it's more of a business issue. How can organizations effectively bridge the gap between business requirements and IT requirements and across our entire supply chain? Okay. Let's go. You've got to communicate those two teams have to talk, right? Being breached is not good for business, and the IT team on understanding what the business initiatives are as well, um, feel like fostering communication between those teams is vital for that. Yeah, I mean, the, the expenditure that goes into it, right? So, uh, you know, as a leadership team in an organization, uh, dollar signs usually get attention, right? And, explaining what those costs and ramifications are to the business in a financial standpoint. Uh, that's the easiest way to get your CFO, your CEO, your COO on board, right? If they see lost productivity, lost dollars, you know, the ransomwares we talked about, you're gonna have to fork over a lot of money to get back your, your data and your network. Uh, it quickly becomes a business decision, not an IT. Uh, same thing from a budgeting standpoint, right? It allows you to uh, offload some of those things from your budget as a sole uh, contributor uh, and allows different areas of the business to take that out as well. Uh, yeah, so I'll uh, continue on uh, there. So I think with your with those two teams, I would say communication is huge. Um, but making sure that your kind of security team is playing also like a supportive role and is kind of involved in those conversations whenever you're building something out and you're actually building an application or you're building out your infrastructure. 
uh, making sure that they are involved, they are giving feedback, and they're actually involved in the process, and they're not just off the wayside saying, oh, is this good? And they're actually working on what you're actually building out and actually trying to work on. Awesome, thank you guys. So there's some emerging technologies. We hear a lot about AI. Um, who's used ChatGPT? Many people. Yeah, ChatGPT. Um, you know, that, that actually creates, or any type of open uh, AI platform, um, that there's benefits from it, there's also risks that organizations have. So that's one of the emerging technologies that organizations need to really consider. I mean, what are those policies in place? But when we look at emerging technologies, IoT, you know, every device that's on the network, whether it's your refrigerator, whether it's your thermostat, whether it's your camera, whether it's your door, your ring doorbell is an IoT device and other things. With these emerging threat, with these emerging technologies, IoT and specifically AI, what can organizations do to mitigate the risk from a cyber attack? Uh, more specifically with IoT devices, um, you need to know what's in your network. So making sure if you're doing um, consistent, say, scans to find new devices, once you find, say, a new device, you need to understand and try to find out what that device is. Is that a random IoT device or is that a new, a new laptop on your network? Kind of making sure that you're aware of what's going on in your network, which devices are on your network, and new ones, and that can really help with that IoT problem. Yeah, building separate networks is, is key as well. Right, so uh, putting in multiple connections from an ISP standpoint, segmenting those off so it's not on the corporate network. Uh, those IoT uh, applications are not accessing or don't have the ability to access that corporate infrastructure. Um, and if you are limited to a single circuit or kind of have a, a more flat network, I uh, highly recommend redesigning that. At minimum, putting in the VLANs, right, protecting those areas of your, your corporate infrastructure so there's not cross-contamination. Awesome, thank you. We'll wrap it up quickly. Um, you know, this is truly about social hour and being able to get everybody together. But you know, one important thing you actually asked a question regarding incident response, and I want to see what you guys think about that. But incident response, I mean, it, it truly is. If not, it's not. It's not if it's when something will happen, whether it's directly to your organization or within your supply chain, something will occur. So there will be that boom that will happen to the organization whether you've experienced a BEC, business email compromise, whether you've had a ransomware attack, which actually occurs every eight seconds. Eight seconds, every eight seconds there's a ransomware attack. So that boom happens. What is that initial response like? So what can organizations do, as a final question, to really prepare themselves for an incident response plan that can get them back up and operational when something does occur? Yeah, so when, you're, when building out incident response plans, um, certain things, making sure that in those plans, um, there's kind of step-by-step -step scenarios for kind of each uh, facet of what would happen. Uh, so making sure things like who who would be who needs to be notified, where where do you need to be notified on, which communication channel should be using, things like that. Making sure there's a clear and concise policy and procedure on who needs to be communicated to, and which teams are involved in clear written uh, kind of roles for team members and even teams and specific team members? Yeah, you have to test it, right? Uh, a lot of organizations will go through the steps of putting together kind of the best practice. They'll build their, their data replications. They'll leverage cloud ecosystems, et cetera, keep things off-site so they can back up quickly, things like that, but never test it. So when it does happen, you go to, to flip the switch and try to reboot up and uh, go from where that, that incident occurred, you've never tested it. So you're dead in the water. Right, so it, it is key to make sure that you implement it, but you're testing it in on a regular basis to ensure uh, nothing's corrupted, nothing has uh, occurred to uh, prevent that from being a seamless process for you. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panelists. Um, at Empus, we have many different partners that we work with. I mean, these are strategic partners that we have with Coio and with Cyber, with Cyber QP. Um, please check them out, speak with them. I really want to appreciate you guys for being on the panel today. I know this is an investment from you guys, everybody from being here. Enjoy the rest of the night. Truly, this, is, this isn't a full education series. We're not going to drown you on the content. Love to have expand these conversations further. Hopefully, this opens up the conversation for things to think about. But uh, thank you once again. Thank you to everybody for being
being attentive and for being here. We know it's a big commitment for everybody. So thank you.